Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Maryland Native Plant Society's webinar on restoring wild rice marshes, the Anacostia Rivers filters, with Jorge Bogantes from the Anacostia Watershed Society. Um, I'm Ann DeNovo, I'll be your host. And we also have with us this evening Robin Gray from the Anacostia Watershed Society. Our speaker this evening is Jorge Bogantes. He is a natural resources specialist with the Anacostia Watershed Society in Bladensburg, Maryland. He leads a number of ecological restoration projects on public parklands in the tidal Anacostia River and its tributaries, including wetland restoration, reforestation, creating meadows and wildlife conservation. He has a BS in natural resource management and protection, which he earned in San Jose, Costa Rica, where he is from. And before moving to the US, he worked in his country on issues related to tropical biodiversity conservation. So now, Jorge, I'm going to turn it over to you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks so much. To, for, to the Maryland Native Plant Society to, for allowing me to do this uh, talk. And uh, yeah, happy to share our uh, experiences in the mighty Anacostia River. So restoring wild rice marshes, the Anacostia River filters. Um, so this is part of the, the Maryland Native Plant Society theme, uh, uh, Year of, of the Grasses. 2020 is the Year of the Grasses. And uh, this photo that you see is uh, from Kingman Marsh in DC, north of Benning Road. So a little bit about Anacostia Watershed Society for the folks that don't, don't know the organization. Uh, we're based in Bladensburg, Maryland, and our goal is to make the river, the Anacostia River, fishable and swimmable by 2025. Uh, we do that through a number of programs, including environmental education, restoration, uh, recreational activities, and advocacy. Um, so the Anacostia River is a tiny watershed in the bigger Chesapeake Bay watershed, which is the Chesapeake Bay is 63,000 square miles. And the red watershed you see there is on, on, on the left is the Potomac River watershed. And that tiny uh, yellow dot is the Anacostia uh, River watershed. Uh, so the Anacostia River is about 170 square miles. Uh, most of it is in Maryland. 85% of the watershed is in Maryland. Um, the other 15% is uh, the Eastern half of DC. And um, it's a very urban watershed, and, uh, but it has a lot of uh, natural jewels and, and the tidal marshes uh, are one of those. So the Anacostia River wetlands, so the, the, the tidal segment of the river is uh, eight miles and uh, it, uh, around that uh, tidal uh, main stem, there's a lot of wetlands in and around. Uh, but in total, there's over 5,000 acres of, of wetlands in the Anacostia River watershed. That's about 5% of the watershed area, mostly in the coastal plain. So if you see right here uh, the, the DC boundary and then perpendicular to it is the county line. Uh, so Montgomery County to the west and PG County east. So most of the PG County and DC uh, are on the coastal plain, uh, a lot of the wetlands are there. Um, the river has lost a lot of wetlands because, you know, this is a, the DMV area, a metropolitan area. So there's been a lot of, uh, you know, wetland destruction in, for centuries, pretty much since the European settlement. Uh, one thing about the rivers is this is a tidal river, but it is a freshwater system. It gets the push from the tide from the Chesapeake Bay, but it is not brackish. It is a freshwater system. And it's a very sluggish system. Uh, so the low tides and high tides, so very low energy, 
uh, the estimated water residence time is between 20 to 30 days. Uh, so it's, that makes it a, an excellent sediment trap. And that's why we have faced some issues with sediment and pollution that are, that are now being uh, tackled uh, with big kudos to the DC Department of the Energy and Environment for big push to clean the river. Um, right now, there's about 120 acres of tidal emergent wetlands in the Anacostia River, in the tidal Anacostia River. All of those are restored. Uh, Revegetation and other through other restoration actions, these wetlands have been created. So, because the river used to be much wider, uh, and the configuration of the tidal emerging wetlands was completely different before. Uh, as you can see in this picture, this is uh, the confluence with Doolin Creek right here, and then where the kayakers are, that's the the main stem of the river. Dueling Creek used to be uh, the is the old bed of the Anacostia River. Where the kayakers are, that's kind of a, a created channel by, by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, um, but river, the river is an awesome place for paddling at high tide. Highly recommended up, up river from there, Bladesburg Waterfront Park. There's actually a new dock actually right across. You don't see it on the photo. So it's a wonderful place to just explore nature and native plants. So why wetlands? Uh, wetlands are key uh, ecosystems, uh, not only in the Anacostia watershed and the DC region, pretty much in the world. They are uh, outstanding carbon uh, uh, sinks they excel at carbon sequestration and they also transform and cycle a lot of nutrients, uh, toxics and sediment. That's why they call them the, the kidneys uh, of, the, of a watershed. They are the kidneys of the lands and the watersheds that surround them. Uh, they are great at flood control. They absorb all that water like a sponge and then slowly release it and then uh, if we allow rivers to flood in wetlands, then that sponge with all that marsh vegetation does its job of cleaning the water. Uh, and then it's a huge sink for biodiversity too, um, uh, from all kinds of uh, aquatic organisms, birds to uh, invertebrates uh, to fish, uh, wetlands are outstanding fish nursery. So they have an importance for, you know, fisheries of different kind, recreational, commercial, and, uh, and food, actually, not so much in the Anacostia River. That's not an, uh, uh, a thing in the Anacostia River. In the past, yes, of course, but, you know, cranberries are produced in wetlands. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, yay for Thanksgiving and cranberries, uh, which are, come from a wetland ecosystem about carbon sequestration is really fascinating because wetlands have some of the highest stores of soil carbon in the whole biosphere. And they have about a third of, of the total uh, Earth's soil carbon um, reserves. And they only cover about 6% of the, the, the planet's area. So they are relatively small, but they have a huge um, role in carbon sequestration. Why, why does that happen? Because the anoxic conditions of a wetland, uh, when you dig a wetland soil, you're gonna find those dark color in the soil. So that shows uh, the anoxic conditions, the low oxygen conditions that allow slow decomposition and lead to the accumulation of a lot of organic matter, uh, like peatlands in more of the highlands in Western Maryland and other peatlands are also outstanding at that. Uh, so freshwater inland wetlands hold uh, 10 times more carbon than saltwater uh, wetlands. So that's, that's pretty amazing. And biodiversity wise and plant diversity, you find a lot of interesting stuff in these wetlands. In the non-tidal wetlands of the Anacostia River, 
like at the Gateways Wetland, which is part of the Anacostia Park, we we found these tiny plants, wolfias. They are some of the smallest flowering plants in the world. Um, don't be confused by the name, Wolfia brasiliensis and Wolfia, Wolfia colombiana. Uh, they sound like exotic, but they are actually native to here. And they are actually rare. Uh, one is, an, is considered rare and the other watch list in Maryland. DC doesn't list plants, only wildlife, but these, these plants are pretty amazing. And right in, uh, here in the nation's capital, you see the, the, the pond on, on the right, see that pea soup green color? That's all the water meal mixed with duck weeds in this non-tidal wetland. Now, this used to be a tidal wetland, but because of all the alterations, it's now uh, a non-tidal system, but it's been isolated for so many decades that it's now a rich ecosystem in its own. Uh, American lotus, everybody, everyone knows the Asian lotus at Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens, but we do have a couple of populations of American lotus, Nalum bolutia. Uh, one, of the, one of those populations was um, propagated by AWS before my time. And then you find all the amazing uh, wildlife, beavers, which every year we see more and more beavers. They are wetland engineers. <laughs> uh, that's uh, me playing Steve Irwin with a big snapping turtle at Kingman Lake. Uh, frogs like this green frog, uh, garter snakes, uh, Long-nosed gar, which is an, an amazing fish. You see, this is a juvenile, so it comes to show the importance of wetlands as, as nurseries. In this case, actually, this was a, at an underwater grass bed at Bosser Point, uh, which are also as important as the marshes. Uh, the great egrets, Sora rail, although this one is from the Patuxent River, but I did see one last year. And I'll talk more about that because with more wild rice, uh, will we see more Sora railed? At least that's our hope. And mussels, uh, but that's a, a topic of another conversation. One mussel can filter 10 to 20 gallons of water a day. They are more in the aquatic part and not so much in the wetland or marsh per se. Um, okay, so first about the, the, the issues facing uh, the, 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 uh, the, in the, wet, the, the issues that these wetlands are facing. So the resident Canada goose population is a big one that is being tackled. This, these geese were introduced in the 1940s from the Midwest uh, for different purposes as hunting decoys and such when that was not uh, forbidden. And these birds are here to stay. And any bird, any geese you see in midsummer in golf course or a big lawn area, is, those are resident in Canada geese. And they, they eat and poop a lot, pretty much. And uh, as, if plants like wild rice are some of the main targets because they are very palatable for them. They love them. So as you can see in the picture, they heavily grazed on wild rice leaving only mudflats. Mudflats are good for, you know, shore birds and some other organisms, but the Anacostia River was made up of marshes, marshlands. So thick marshes with, you know, a lot of high diversity, high plant diversity, not mudflats. Mudflats were just a minority of the area. So we don't want those big areas of mudflats. We want marshes. We want the kidneys of the Anacostia watershed. Uh, another issue is the emerald ash borer. In the last uh, few years, it has devastated the forests. You can see that before and after picture taken from the West Bank facing the East Bank on the Bladensburg side of the river. Uh, one taken, the before photo taken in 2011, uh, the other photo six years later in 2017. Uh, in, in the summer. So you can see in midsummer when you see all those leafless trees, chances are those are dead or dying ash trees. By now, almost all are pretty dead. What's alive is the seedlings and the saplings. And you can see this one again at the Gateways Wetlands. You can see all the dead ash trees, very evident when we did a helicopter flight with the National Park Service. 
So AWS has been doing this for over 14 years, 14, 16 years and plus. Uh, so we have worked in over 20 acres of mostly tidal wetlands in DC and Maryland, uh, doing a lot of native plant revegetation, doing the goose fencing, and I'll talk about that. Uh, all, the, the, all the wild rice seed has been collected at Jug Bay in the Patuxent River. That's our seed source. And more recently doing uh, Phragmites control. So the geese, they are like airplanes. So they need big areas to land and take off. When you disrupt, break up the area into smaller units, they won't land there. So that's why you see all these circles here. Each one of these circles is one of our plots pretty much. They are about 900 square feet uh, within those plots, which are uh, fencing. You'll see the, the, uh, the next photos. Uh, we planted all the wild rice and other, the other species we, we have propagated. And you can see around the circle, uh, well, this is at high tide, but at low tide, those are mudflats. So inside the, the circle, the corral, everything grows. Outside, everything was grazed. Now that is changing, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll say why. First, this is the fencing. It's about, we put like eight foot posts, um, pound them on the mud and with a four feet galvanized fence. Um, and that uh, excludes the geese, so they won't land there to eat the vegetation unless there's a breach in the, in the fence. Another thing that we did in the past years, because it took a long time for the National Park Service to approve a population control. So before that, we had to do non-lethal uh, methods. Uh, goose egg oiling is one of them. In the spring, we go with vegetable grade, uh, you know, cooking grade vegetable oil, uh, like corn oil, uh, spray the eggs with oil so that prevents the embryos from developing. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that partly helped, but it is until now when, when they are doing um, population control, the roundups that's being done by the USDA, that the populations have gone down. Uh, when we started, uh, well, let's say like in 2009, there were around 500 to 600 geese just in the DC portion of the Anacostia River. Uh, right now, I think it's around 150 birds, uh, resident birds. Now you see more because now you get the migratory subspecies, which is native to this region. It has always been there. So they spend the summer in Canada leave in the spring and then come back in the fall and sp spend the winter here because it's milder than in Canada. But any birds that you see year round in midsummer, that's the resident subspecies of the Canada goose. So wild rice has been a, a keystone species. In the 1800s, people came to the Anacostia River hunting for Sora rail because the, it was like the Patuxent River. I tell people, if you go to Jug Bay in the Patuxent River, that's probably what the Anacostia River used to look like in the 1700s. So that has become sort of our reference ecosystem. Not only that, that's where we collect our seed for propagation. So a little bit about the wild rice. So wild rice uh, belong to the grass family. Uh, in the Cyzania genus, uh, there's four species. Uh, uh, it's a monoecious plant, so it, it has like both sexes in the same plant. Uh, it used to be called, had different names like Indian rice, Canada rice, or Manumin in the Ojibwe uh, language, Native American language in, in the Great Lakes region. Uh, or uh, water oats is another name. Locally, we just know it as wild rice. Um, the grain is eaten, uh, especially in the Great Lakes area, but there's, there's uh, knowledge that Native Americans all over used to eat it. Um, and also there's a species in China and people eat it there. And in China, they also eat the stem, the, like the tender part of the stem. 
So it is a cereal, not a rice, because the rice we know, like the Asian rice, Orisa sativa, is a different species, the same family, but uh, kind of a distant causing of this one. So again, it's considered a cereal, not a rice. Uh, the species, so there's four species in the world. Um, that's what I meant to say. In, in, the, in the US, there's three species the northern wild rice, Cycenia palustris, that's the one you see on the photo on the upper right. That's the one you get at the grocery store. Uh, it has a fattier, uh, dark grain than the one we find in the Anacostia River. Um, the east, which is the eastern wild rice, is our rice here, is, is all over the east coast pretty much. And then there's the uh, Texas wild rice, which is, uh, is, is um, it's a RTE species, it's a rare threatened or endangered. I think it's threatened. It's only found in central Texas and, uh, and it's very rare. Um, the, the lower photo there is a, is a wild rice pouch made by the uh, Native Americans, the Ojibwe uh, Native American in, in the Great Lakes region. Now our rice, the Eastern wild rice, Cycenia aquatica, the variety is aquatica, uh, is a tall grass. It can reach over, you know, 10 feet tall. Uh, it's an annual species. Oh, something interesting is that the both Northern species, Palostris and aquatica are annuals. The one in Texas, the rare species is a perennial, perhaps because of the, the warmer weather down there, the, the plant, doesn't need to be annual. Um, so the inflorescence is called a panicle, as you can see in the, in the photo. So it has uh, unisexual branches. So below, you're gonna find the, the staminate flowers with uh, the male flowers. And then on top right here, uh, those are the pistillate uh, branches with the female flowers. And those are the ones that become the rice, the grain. So the, yeah, the seed is considered a grain. It's a long cylindrical, uh, uh, very thin uh, grain with two inches with on. The no on looks like a needle and I'll show you what's the purpose of that needle. Then that needle or on can be two inches long so wild rice in the Anacostia River blooms and, and seeds uh, starts blooming in June and you're gonna see, see the rice until October. By then it starts dying back and then until next year. That's why the strategy of the plant is to produce a ton of seed. So it's a very prolific seeder. Uh, these are the grains of our Anacostia wild rice, the Eastern wild rice. And these are the grains uh, the, and the, look at the ons facing upward. So it pretty much drops onto the mud and nails into the substrate. And that's how it gets dispersed by the wind. Uh, reminiscent of other wetland plants, like the, when you go to Southern Florida, the, the red mangrove trees also present in other tropical areas of the world, similar long, like needle-like um, seed pods or uh, fruits. We do find some other grasses, wetland grasses in the Anacostia River. And I'm gonna show you some of the most common ones I find in the tidal emerging wetlands. So barnyard grasses in the Echinocloa genus. Uh, there's both native and non-native species. Uh, but we find uh, Walteri and, and Echinocloa cruz galli. Those are two common species. And then rice cut grass, which is an interesting one because the, the leaves are very sharp, hence the name. And um, I don't know if you can see on the upper right, the nodes are, have rings of hairs that are very typical of the Laersia genus. You might be also familiar with Laersia virginica, which is the terrestrial causing of this cut grass. That is also a look-alike for the Japanese steel grass. Uh, now this one, the rice cut grass, you would only find it in wetlands. 
the reed canary grass. Um, this photo is from Bladensburg, from tidal wetlands in Bladensburg, and then Phragmites, the invasive Phragmites. So how do we do the, the rice collection? Around August, September, depending on the year, we go out there uh, and bag the seed heads. So several panicles, join them together and put a Tyvek bag uh, and then close it with zip ties. So that way we allow the seed to be collected and not get lost in, in the wetland. Uh, and we leave it there for a couple of weeks to ripen. After that time, we go back and collect the, cut the panicles, separate the seed from the bags and the panicles, and then we store the seed in, in the refrigerator over the winter. In places like Minnesota and those uh, in the Midwest, Western states, uh, because they have hard winters, they might just put it on, uh, on a bag at the bottom of a stream or a pond and it's cold enough all winter long to, 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 to be safe to do that. In the Anacostia, it's not that reliable, especially now with crazy weather patterns. Um, wild rice seeding, so we uh, go out there in April and mix the, the grains with the, with the mud from the wetland until it looks kind of like cow dung <laughs> and then uh, broadcast it by hand and inside the, the enclosures. Right now it's not as critical because the goose population is being managed. So we have more freedom to spread it in other not necessarily fenced sites. And about Two, three weeks later, you're gonna see this, uh, the little seedlings popping up from the mud. And then in by August, you're gonna see this. Uh, this you, you can see the beautiful uh, flowers that are yellow green below. Those, the, those are the male flowers. And then on top, the female flowers that contain the, the that will contain the grains. Uh, here's a closer photo against the sky. It's just a, a pretty plant and it's like so um, characteristic of the summer in the Anacostia River and all the tidal rivers here in, the, in our region. So this area is at, at Kingman uh, Lake, Kingman Marsh by the Langston Golf Course, north of Benning Road, northeast in northeast DC. Uh, so in 2014, uh, you can see how we fenced the area. We also planted some perennials. You can see the volunteers planting some of perennials here. And then that area we had uh, uh, spread the wild rice. And then you can see uh, now uh, how it's looking like it right now. This was in the summer, about July of, of this present year. So it's just a thick, it's around two acres of solid wild rice. However, I don't know if you can see it, but right here, there's some Phragmites that I'm gonna need to take care of it before it gets out of control. It's the population of Phragmites that popped up. Uh, of course, you know, the invasives are always present. So. We're gonna to have to deal with that uh, next year, perhaps before it gets out of control. But look at the before and after of this. This is one of the most rewarding plantings that you can do because this is an annual plant. If everything goes well, uh, you know, it grows a lot in, in one growing season. So it's one of the most rewarding things you can do. And this is the, the same area uh, from, from a helicopter. Uh, solid area of wild rice, what we call the wild rice refugia, is acting as a seed source uh, in the river. So this year was an amazing year. We saw about uh, seven acres of wild rice. Uh, normally we see three acres or less um, uh, is more patchy, but this year is really, it was a very nice cover in the in the areas at Kingman Marsh, uh, north of um, Benning Road. 
another thing we do related to grasses, although in this case, uh, an invasive grass phragmite is phragmitis control. Uh, we've done this um, since probably in the last, I would say the last seven years or so. Uh, we employ a number of methods, mechanical, chemical, uh, not only ourselves, we also, you know, contract other uh, companies to do that because some of the jobs are pretty tough and demanding. Like, as you can see, it might require uh, treatment by boats. Uh, back in the day, we submitted tissue samples for genetic analysis to the Chicago Botanic Garden. And uh, thinking that we could have native phragmites, but guess what? All samples were determined as the uh, exotic genotype. Uh, so that's why we started doing the, the removal. Uh, but even in the thick phragmites, although a very small minority in terms of cover, we do find some other plants, a lot native, so they're not native, um, like uh, Mycenia scandens right here is uh, the climbing hemp vine, it's a native. Peltandra virginica uh, is aroarum is, is just because it's very common in the in the river. Geese don't like to eat it because it has a, a, a chemical compound that is irritant for them. So that's why aroarum is overabundant pretty much, which is, is, a, is a good thing. Although we would like to see more diversity and that, that's why we plant other species. Uh, in Patchens capensis, jewel weed, you see that. Um, this other invasive, Lithrum salicaria, uh, better known as purple loose trife, uh, is more patchy in the Anacostia River. It's not as dense as it would grow in colder climates like the New England or the Great Lakes. Uh, typha, which, you know, the Typha latifolia, which is the, the broadleaf cattail. We also have narrow leaf cattail, which is not native, but it is native to the country, but not native to the, the region. I, I wouldn't consider that an invasive, but I mean, I rather have uh, cattails than Phragmites. Uh, black willow, which can also grow when, when, the, when the sediments consolidate, uh, that's when the trees start growing and, and black willow is one of the most common. Uh, and yeah, we've seen some successes in the past. This is at the Gateway Wetland, the wetland I showed at the beginning in 2013. And then three years later, this was one of the best cases of removal where we successfully removed the cover, at least for a few years. And then we got a good response from the, the, the seed bank. So we got a lot of rushes, as you can see in the picture and monkey flower, uh, which I'm forgetting the, the scientific name right now, uh, sedges. Uh, in the back, you can see still some phragmites, but all this was native and it was amazing. Uh, and this is the project we are tackling right now. It's uh, Kingman Marsh. Uh, this was in 2015, prior to the phragmites removal. So you can see where the arrows are pointing that's where the thick Phragmites uh, growth is, um, uh, was there. I mean, was, these populations were probably there for, you know, 20 years uh, before we started removal. Uh, and then this is what, how they look right now. So this was looking from north and this one uh, is looking from south, from the opposite side. Um, so you can still see some light, uh, uh, some kind of pale color, that's the dead Phragmites. So it doesn't look as thick and green as here because the, the herbicide applications have taken effect. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, this uh, south of this patch right here, we see a lot of natives creeping in, which is good. Um, uh, this was another, uh, phragmites removal. So all this patch that looks kind of brown, that's where we remove phragmites, is dead phragmites. Only this area in the circle was the regrowth. And this kind of like light green, these are black willow trees. Um, however, uh, 
it's been really tough because phragmite is come is a very tough plant to remove. If you don't remove it consistently every single year, it will come back. If you leave it alone for one growing season or even more, even worse for two growing seasons, and it comes back. It's it you know it's a grass, so it's you know it's a C4 plant, so it just grows like crazy. Uh, it's biologically very successful, so that's why it's so hard to control. Uh, but the good uh, good story when we remove it successfully, we see a resurgence of native plants and, and other plants. And this is a, a list of the plants uh, that we normally see after removal, depending on the gradient, because you got the high marsh closer to the shoreline that has a lot of species. And then the more you go down, the um, the more inundated the areas are. So that's called the low marsh. So wild rice, for example, would like the low and mid marsh. Uh, and in the high marsh, you're gonna see uh, cattails, for example, and other species. Um, right here in the photo, it was a case where, you know, we removed Phragmites. There was some regrowth of Phragmites, but look at all the duck potato. Um, uh, it was a, there was a great growth of duck potato and uh, but again it is really hard and it has um, I don't like to end with a negative note like this but the unless you really control phragmites diligently every year you know you you lose the battle unfortunately and uh, and I see that as a big problem because uh, who has the resources for that? I mean, you see even federal government, uh, they have crews and I mean, they can even barely make it. And uh, for a small nonprofit like AWS, it's just really hard to, to do that. And uh, so again, we've, we've seen a mixed panorama. So successes, but also a disappointing um, resurgence of phragmites in some areas and 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 i uh, sadly acknowledge that uh, uh, but what's what's in the future of the tidal anacostia wetlands so one of the good news is and you see in the picture is the resurgence of um, submerged aquatic vegetation or underwater grasses uh, last year uh, the potomac had probably like around a thousand square feet of uh, submerged aquatic grasses, whereas the Anacostia had almost uh, 90 acres or so, most of it around Kingman Island. So, so the Anacostia has seen an amazing resurgence. There's a lot of hydrilla, but I've seen that aquatic ecologists uh, have been kind of warming up to it because hydrilla has a lot of benefits for fish and birds. Uh, and once the the this the underwater grass establishes, you get other species natives like Valisneria. The one in the photo that looks like a grass is Valisneria americana, wild celery. We have propagated it. We're now on hold for that because remediation actions will take place in the river. So we don't want to plant areas that will get dredged or capped in the near future. But that's one of the biggest great news for the Anacostia, the underwater grasses in the last few years. Uh, and there's also less geese. Uh, and, and the geese had a lot of grazing impact on the, not only on the marshes, but also on the underwater grasses. And also, you know, contributing to the, to the, the, the fecal pollution in the river as well. Uh, so water, quality has been improving. The river got a passing grade again last year for the second time. And, you know, that might sound mediocre, but for the Anacostia River, it's just a huge step forward from being a, a, a very, uh, for me, the forgotten river uh, to being a, a, a very desirable river to be. Now there's even real estate companies making the pitch to, oh, come live in the Anacostia River because it's, it's better now. Um, so more wetland restoration is going on, not only by us, but also the DC government is going to ramp up 
restoration actions. And then there's the sediment remediation, which is, is a huge milestone for the Anacostia River. So we have the, the Anacostia River tunnel that is cutting sewage by 88%. And now remediation looks like it's gonna happen in the next few years. So uh, it's not crazy anymore to talk about a, a swimmable Anacostia River in the, in the near future. Um, uh, I guess again on, on, the, on the downside, we've got climate change and sea level rise, which is gonna change the configuration of, of the marshlands in the Anacostia River, um, uh, perhaps drastically. And that's what we know from the different scenarios of sea level rise. Uh, and more phragmites and other invasives, we don't know yet. It looks like that's the case, but, um, but you know, may, maybe not. Maybe some other outcome will occur, but some, uh, these are some of the things that we'll see in the future of the Anacostia River. And, uh, and now I will open this for questions. This is uh, a little earlier, I guess, or it's 8.17. So thank you so much. And I'll be happy to, to answer questions. Hey, Robin. Hi, thanks, Jorge. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, I've been trying to group your questions as they come in. Uh, and we'll start with the most wild rice specific ones and sort of get broader from there. Yeah. Uh, so one of the questions, uh, a couple of questions about the native wild rice. Did native Americans use wild rice in any way? And what um, species of birds or mammals? Oh yeah, so yeah. The Wild rice benefits a lot of different birds, uh, sora rails, uh, dogs. Uh, we normally see uh, red-winged blackbirds. Those are some of the most uh, common uh, birds in the wild rice areas. In mammals, we see a lot of muskrats. They, they, eat, the, the, they eat the soft part of the stems. And, uh, and not only that, if you think about it at high tide, uh, with the submerged um, environment, you get a lot of fish at the foot of the wild rice plants using, you know, brown bullheads, mommy chug, uh, uh, young fish, but also adult fish, you know, mommy chug and mosquito fish. So it's just an amazing habitat from all perspectives, from birds, uh, uh, um, fish, and so forth. Folks were asking, is the native frag as aggressive as the non-native does does the native frag have wildlife value and could introducing the native one perhaps help it outcompete the invasive fragmites? That's a good question. That's something we haven't considered. The native fragmites is known to be more grow more patchy, whereas the exotic tends to grow in big stands. I normally tell people when also when you drive from here to New York City in this in, around New York in the New Jersey area, you see thousands of acres. That's all the invasive Phragmites. Uh, that's a, a perfect example of what Phragmites uh, can become. Uh, the native one, you know, again, grows more patchy. There's some populations known from the toxin, but I haven't seen them myself. Is more common in the Gulf of Mexico areas, not so much in our, in our region. So if we haven't considered that, that's an interesting idea. I would be worried about hybridization. Uh, and we know, we have, I've heard populations of native Phragmites in the patoxin. I haven't seen them myself. Uh, I know it's more common in the Gulf of Mexico areas and not so much in our region. Someone asked, um, where did it go? Why, why wild rice? Like, why were we focused? I'm looking for the exact question. Good question, because it was a big component of the Anacostia tidal marshlands. Uh, that, uh, that's, that's why I compare it with Jug Bay in the Patuxent River. That's what the Anacostia used to look like before, because it's a, a similar uh, ecosystem in the tidal freshwater uh, 
in the Chesapeake Bay region. So yeah. Mm -hmm. We had some questions about sort of the comparative nature of the different, the tidal and the freshwater and the salt. Uh, one was why are freshwater wetlands so much more effective at carbon sequestration than tidal salt marshes? Hmm, that, that's a good question. A lot from that analysis uh, comes from uh, peatlands. Uh, uh, now, I I'd honestly wouldn't know comparing tidal freshwater with tidal, uh, you know, salt water. They are probably sort of similar, uh, but the ones that really make a big difference are the peatlands um, because they do store uh, deeper, uh, uh, the, the soils are deeper, so they, do, they store more organic matter. Uh, again, I wouldn't know how to answer that. Again, a, a tidal freshwater versus tidal salt water. We have a question about habitat. Will wild rice grow only in freshwater, only in tidal areas? And what about those other um, water grasses you mentioned in terms of their preferred habitats? Yeah, so the the kind of the stronghold of wild rice is tidal freshwater wetlands. It can grow in some non-tidal areas. Actually, we successfully spread it at the Gateway Wetlands, that pond that I showed. Uh, so it does grow in some non-tidal wetlands, but it, the optimum habitat seems to be the, the, the tidal freshwater wetlands. Now, those other species like... Uh, Echinocloa, like the barnyard grass and cut grass, you may also find them in non-tidal wetlands. Uh, although they are mostly um, obligate wetland plants, it means that you're gonna only find them in wetlands. Perhaps uh, exception of the barnyard grass, the Echinocloa cruz galley, you might find it in other uh, habitats. Echinocloa, well, terry, not so much, only in wetlands. So. And rice cut grass, yeah, definitely only in wetlands, yeah, yeah. Someone asked, once you get a stand of wild rice growing, does it self-seed and sustain itself? Yeah, for a year, right, because it's an annual. So the strategy of the plant is to produce a lot of grain and then uh, dies in October. So, so it's up to the next generation to continue the, the, the population. Someone offered the, um, the Latin for monkey flower, Mimulus alata or Mimulus regens. What, what, is that? what is that species? Uh, for monkey flower, you were reaching for the uh, Latin for monkey flower and someone had offered that up. Oh, Mimulus regens. Okay, okay, great. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's an awesome plant and I, I don't see it in, a in the tidal environment. I've only seen it in those non-tidal wetlands, yeah. And someone said, isn't duck potato Sagittaria latifolia? Yes, that's the species. There's other Sagittarias, but latifolia is what we find in the Anacostia River. Uh, someone asked, does runoff from the adjacent golf course affect your restoration efforts? Not really, because for the most part, so we have also planted uh, vegetative buffers I was actually up there this morning. We're planting to. We're planning on enhancing one of them. Uh, they, these were gaps uh, where the golf course met the river without any further vegetation. So we planted vegetative buffers, but for the most part, the shoreline is is forested. So the runoff hasn't been an issue. They do apply stuff fertilizers and stuff like that. But because there are buffers, uh, we don't get that. That's not an issue in the wetlands. All right. I'm, those are sort of the grouped ones. And now I'm going to jump around as I see them. Someone asked, why do geese avoid landing on mudflats when they readily land on agricultural fields? You talked about them needing, needing larger areas. Oh, yeah, because in the wetland, wetland is one of their natural habitats. So they do find a lot of foods in the form of 
uh, foliage, uh, seeds, and uh, submerged aquatic plants. So really they do find a lot of resources in the wetland ecosystem. And again, agricultural areas, they, they use it opportunistically. And when there's a lot, well, they spend a lot of time there, but the, the marshlands are one of their natural habitats. And another question about geese. Someone writes, I am concerned about the geese population. Can alternative habitat for them be established so they do not interfere with the reclamation? Um, not really, because it's um, really hard to really control where, where they go. They do gravitate a lot into the wetland because again, it's one of their natural habitats. Um, uh, yeah, I, I hope that answers the question. A question about what's what's sort of next for wild rice restoration. You know, we have the, you talked about the spots where it's coming back and, and how AWS is doing it. And um, is that gonna continue or expand or um, just maintain what we've got or what's, what's sort of the next step? Yeah, so right now we're gonna continue doing some uh, seeding uh, as we have always done it. And uh, one area that we're focusing now is the area where, where we are removing Phragmites at Kingman Marsh. So I've been uh, spreading it in, in the areas where I see that the Phragmites is, is dead and is successfully controlled. And um, uh, again, this was a boom year. So I'm very curious about the, the panorama for next year uh, because sometimes what can affect the rise is we, if, let's say if we get like really heavy storms in July, August when the plant is blooming. So that af might affect the seed output in the later season. So far, the rains, the rain, the storm events we have had haven't affected and actually they, they were not an issue this year, clearly, um, but that's a concern. So it depends on how the summer goes um, perhaps all the stars aligned this summer and we got that great growth and I'm optimistic that that would be the case next year. If that's the case, it's going to be very interesting. We might see more than the seven acres we, we, we saw this year. I have one question about that I missed along the way, and that is about purple loosestrife, a big invasive I know where I used to live in central New York. Do we see that much here? Do you have to control it? And if so, what methods do you use? Uh, we've never controlled it just because we have our hands full with Phragmites. Um, I've seen anecdotally perhaps an increase in the population, but like I mentioned, it is still rather patchy. It's not like forming monocultures really, uh, at least in the tidal Anacostia. That's one of the reasons why we haven't uh, controlled it. And we're just focusing on Phragmites, which is the more risky one in terms of forming, you know, those nasty monocultures. I recommend um, next summer, next year, uh, uh, go out and kayak or canoe the river and explore it, especially those areas. Um, to, to access these areas at Kingman Lake, you must go like at mid tide and, or high tide, especially if there's a particularly high tide, it's great because you can sort of navigate the whole island. And it's just a wonderful, you know, especially, you know, between June, August, even better in the fall or even, you know, in the spring. In the spring, you wouldn't see much rice because it's still coming out, but summer or fall, you know, uh, really spring to fall, great times to paddle in the river at high tide. Does wild rice concentrate arsenic? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, you would think it, it does that. A lot of these plants can accumulate uh, a lot of the toxics. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something that... Uh, that it would be interesting to to find out, yeah. And uh, is the tidal rack line, the, the debris, a problem for the goose exclosures? 
But what so can you repeat that one? Is the the woody debris that collects along the uh, the edge of the river um, a problem for the goose exclosures? Oh yeah, yeah. Sometimes it can knock down uh, the the corrals defenses. Yeah. And someone says, "Are the geese edible?" <laughs> oh yes, uh, they taste like um, beef. <laughs> I, they're I've had it. They're protected, is that right, or is it just that you can't hunt? Well, them yeah, I, I had it because uh, uh, the Patuxent River at Jug Bay, they have been doing management of the population even before the Anacostia efforts. So I got a, a, some meat from a friend there, Greg Kearns, the legendary naturalist, gave us a couple of breasts. Uh, they are very thick, red. And they t taste like roast beef a little. You know, it had kind of like a, a kind of gamey taste that I didn't uh, like completely. But it's a very interesting meat. Yeah, it's kind of like a steak more than uh, poultry. <laughs> Are we planting around Dueling Creek? Dueling Creek, yes. That's uh, one of our main. Yeah, yeah that's uh, even before my, my time, uh, Steve McKinley Ward. He did a lot of um, awesome plantings. In the last few years, I've been maintaining or planting more wild rice, but yeah. So so yeah, AWS has been planting there for the last decade at least, yeah. And uh, there is a nice rice population there too, as of this summer. Uh, we also removed some Phragmites there south of the dock. And I did notice a nice uh, wild rice population, probably, you know, like, 2,000 square feet or so, but it was very solid. And that's always good because you, you, you know, it's seeding, uh, it's, it's, the seed are, is, is gonna spread in the area. So, so yeah, it would be interesting to see next year how it looks like. Okay, I think that's all of the questions. All right, thank you so much uh, everyone for joining uh, the talk. And again, I hope to see you in the Anacostia River. Happy Thanksgiving.